feels good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, thankful to be here today. We're going to go to Numbers um, chapter 13 and read a couple verses starting at verse 25. Uh, So thankful to be here. Thankful for the invitation. Give honor to to Pastor today uh, and to his family. Uh, We are blessed with the best. Just it's just all there is and so thankful for him and all that he invests into us numbers chapter 13 beginning at verse 25 this is addressing the spies that Moses sent out into the promised land and this is them coming back and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days 40 days is significant That's a sign of completeness within the Bible. And they went and they came to Moses and to Aaron and to all of the congregation of the children of Israel until the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, we came into the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. For the next few moments this morning, I just want to teach on this subject, evidence of the promise. Evidence of the promise. Could you put your Bibles down and just lift your hands one more time? Let's invite God into this place. Jesus, we love you today. God, I ask that you would touch every heart, God. God, let your word speak to us today like what only it can. Move upon our hearts, touch every soul, make yourself known to us today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, thank you for standing. You can be seated. Chapters, chapter 13 of Numbers is addressing when the children of Israel have departed out of Egypt. And the Bible says that the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying in verse 2, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. God had already established that this land was already given to them. And all that was left or or all that was needed was for the children of Israel to go in and to possess what God had already given them. And so Moses sends out 12 men from each tribe to, to spy out the land of Canaan to see what the promise looks like. He asks these questions, are are there people dwelling there? Are they strong or are they weak? Are there few or are there many? Is the land good or is it bad? Is it fat or is it lean? Are there huts or are there strong houses? And verse 20 says, and be of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. For now the time of the first, it was the time of the first ripe grapes. It seems almost interesting that that Moses asked for them to bring back proof of so many of the questions that he knew the children of Israel would have. As if somehow there was a possibility that this promised land that they had heard of that God was going to give them, that somehow it may not possess the ability to produce fruit. But the reality is that wherever God's word of promise is, there is always blessing there as well. God's word does not only have the creative power within it, but it also contains sustaining power. Therefore, whenever God spoke, and he created the sun to shine every morning. There is not a question if the sun is going to come back up the next morning because the same word that created is also the same word that sustains what was spoken. And there is blessing wherever 
God has established his word. Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning at verse 1, and it shall come to pass. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God. What's his voice? It's his word. It's, it's to observe and to do all of his commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all of these blessings, they shall come on thee. And they shall what? They shall overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Ever since last September, uh, I attended Mark Conference in Indianapolis. Uh, pastor was teaching, and I just, I just kind of follow him all around the country, uh, if I can, even online, if I can find out where, he, where he's preaching. Um, and and he, he spoke of Deuteronomy chapter 28, and he says, read it every day in your home. And so since September, uh, not every day, but, but I've tried almost every day, I have read Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14, out loud in my home. Because there is a promise of blessing that comes with the obedience of his word. Verse 3, blessed shalt thou be in the city. Blessed shalt thou be in the field. Catch this, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. And the fruit of thy ground. And one more, the fruit of thy cattle. The increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be the basket and the store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in. Blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing. Not you, not within your power, not within your might. Not what you can make happen, not the deal that you can create. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses. And in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. I believe that the Bible teaches that there is always something very specific about the place that God calls you to. There's something special in the land. The land that God gives you contains blessings within that promise. Perhaps that's why the enemy fights so hard against the people of God claiming territory because there is a blessing that comes with it. While the children of Israel are fleeing Egypt, it's such a type and shadow of, of many things, but it also represents the significance of God granting a place of blessing for those that are in covenant relationship with him because he gave them, even while they were in Egypt, the land of Goshen because God blesses the land. Goshen was a special place that was spared from the effects that were afflicted upon the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 8, verse 22, God said, I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarm of flies shall be there to the end that thou may knowest that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. God said, I will separate my people from the world. Those that have a relationship and a covenant with me, I will divide between them. The things that afflict one will not afflict the other. Before they ever saw a land that flowed with milk and honey, they still lived in a blessed place despite even though they were in the world of Egypt. Goshen was a literal representation of Psalms chapter 23, verse 5, when it said, Thou preparest a table before me, where? In the presence of mine enemies. It doesn't matter if there's a recession. It doesn't matter if there's economic collapse. It doesn't matter what's happening within the world. 
hyperinflation, it doesn't matter. Because thou preparest a table before me. It doesn't matter what's going on on the outside. Because wherever God is, there's a table prepared. And this is an example of what alignment with the word of God and with the man of God. And living a life of covenant, it produces blessings regardless of what's around you. And just as living a life according to the world's standard, when the children of Israel left, Egypt was in many ways destroyed considering what it had gone through with the plagues. Imagine the impact that it had had upon this nation. Imagine the, the collapse of their infrastructure. Imagine the destitute of their economy. Its armies and its leaders are now at the bottom of the Red Sea and it's falling apart and Egypt has become broke, busted, and disgusted. And I've always wanted to say that, but it, it, it happened. And it's a depiction of what a life without God leads to. And as they were leaving Egypt, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they may send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we be all dead men. We're going to die if these people all stay here. And the people took their dough before it was leavened their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes up on their shoulders, and the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptian jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and raiment. And the Lord, the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required. And the Bible says they spoiled the Egyptians. The Lord did that. It was the Lord that did that. If, uh, if, if you'll do what you can, God will do what only he can. Doesn't matter. It won't make sense. The Lord gave the people favor. Whenever God gives favor it will not compute well with how you rationalize things. Favor doesn't budget well on your Excel document. You can't add favor into your checking balance. Regardless of how hard you try, you cannot rationalize the favor of God. And I like how one preacher said it. He said, favor just ain't fair. Because favor is a blessing that comes with covenant relationship. With God. The children of Israel took with them the wealth of Egypt. God put it into their hands. Everything that they required, everything that they needed, the people of covenant, they didn't have to beg for it, they didn't have to steal it, they didn't have to try to position themselves for it. God gave them the favor and God placed it into their hands. The Bible does not teach that we need to chase blessings. But it does show that when we are in a covenant relationship with God, that blessings begin chasing you. That's why Moses was talking about in Deuteronomy 28 verse 2 when he said, In all of these blessings, they shall come on thee and overtake thee. You won't even be able to control it. You won't even be able to stop it from happening. It's not going to be anything that you can make happen within your power. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all of his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. I'm talking about the blessing, the blessing of God that accompanies the promise of God. And so we find Moses back at our opening text. And the children of Israel in Numbers 13. And they've walked up. And they're standing right on the edge of the promise. 
verse 17, and Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain, verse 23. And they came unto the brook of Eshkel and they cut down from thence a branch with one. Everyone say one. One cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. Can you bring that, bring that staff over here? Thank you, sir. Um, I think Team Ellen's about to say a prayer. Why don't you, why don't you go ahead? <clears throat> Thank you for my staff, Pastor Jordan. Um, so they put it on their shoulders like this. She turned around. Yeah, I know. It's a hard prayer. Work with me, guys. Okay. Bible says one cluster of grapes. Now, <clears throat> I grew up, and my parents they they have a they have a grapevine, <clears throat> and uh, it's been there for a long time. And you can get up under that grapevine whenever it's all bloomed out, and we would uh, we cut clusters of grapes off of that vine. And if you go to the store and you get a cluster of grapes. Um, there's like one or two of those in a bag. The Bible says that when they went into the promised land, they cut one cluster of grapes. And it took two men and a rod to hang one cluster of grapes to carry it back. Now, I tried to find a good answer for this, and it uh, turns out that I can't. All that I can know is that it does not take two men and a rod to carry a normal cluster of grapes. But what I do know is that when your feet step into the promise, that the blessings become more than what you can carry by yourself. There's something about when you step into the promises of God. It becomes more than what you can carry. It becomes more than what you can make sense of. And all that you can do is put it on a rod and say, I've got to take this back to show evidence that there is a promised land. And so here's what they did. One cluster of grapes, two men, and a rod. Bible doesn't tell us, but I like to think that it's Joshua and Caleb carrying that. Bible doesn't say that, but I like to infer that. And what they did is they come back, and they show the people. Go ahead, just go ahead and take a lap. Go ahead. This is the congregation of Israel. Numbers 13, 25. And they returned from searching the land after 40 days. And they went... And they came to Moses and to Aaron. There you go. And to all of the congregation of Israel. That's you. Unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh. And they brought back word unto them and unto all of the congregation. And they showed them. Some of you aren't looking. Look. They showed them the fruit. And they told them, and they said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. Everything that God said, it's happening. Look. Look at the fruit. Here it is. You want to see what the blessing looks like in the promised land? This is what it looks like. It takes two men to carry one cluster of grapes. It's more than we can make sense of. It's more than we can rationalize. When the men returned from spying out the land, the evidence that they brought back with them of the promise was fruit. 
Thanks, guys. You can put that down. It was the fruit of that promise that eradicated any doubt that there was a blessing upon the land that surely God was going to give them. Fruit has always been evidence of God's promise. That's why Paul would write in Galatians 5 verses 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, is peace, is long-suffering, is gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law because fruit has always been evidence of promise. But the question that I have come to pose here this morning in this first word session is why was the fruit not enough for the children of Israel? And instead of possessing the land, they murmured on the edge of the promise. Moses told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 1, beginning at verse 29. This is Moses talking to the children of Israel. They've seen the promise. They've seen the blessing. They've seen all of it. God has said he's going to give it to them. But it's not enough. They, they, they've seen a cluster of grapes like most likely they have never seen before. They say it's a good land. It does flow with milk and honey, just like God said it would. But it's not enough. And Moses said, I, I, I said unto you, dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God which goeth before you, he shall fight for you. According to all that he did for you in Egypt, before your eyes and in the wilderness thou hast seen that the Lord thy God bear thee as a man doth bear his son in all of the ways that you went until you came into this place. He's saying, don't you remember everything that God has done? Everything that you've witnessed with your eyes, yet in this thing, what thing? Possessing the land of promise, where there was blessing beyond what they could control, beyond what they could reason. In this thing, you did not believe the Lord your God. You have seen all that God did for you in Egypt and in the wilderness with your own eyes. But when it comes to possessing something that is promised, this thing, you don't believe. You don't believe God can do it. Out of everything that you have experienced, out of everything that you have witnessed, this is the thing. That you won't believe. And the question that I have come with here today. And please know that I respect everyone in this room so much. But the question that I have come here today. Is to ask how much do you need to see. In order to believe that the promises of God are for you and for your family. I, I just have a simple question of what's it going to take in order for you to believe that every promise that's in this book is not for somebody else, but it's for you. How long will you remain content to be a spectator on the outside of the promise Looking in at the blessing of God, but never possessing the promise of God. How could you have seen so much? How could
could you have experienced so much? How could you have seen what he's done in your life? How could you have seen what he's done in your family? How could you have seen how he put things back together that would have never happened any other way? But still, when it comes to walking in the promise and the favor of God, so many people think that that's for somebody else. So many people think that the promise doesn't apply to them. So many people are held back by the things that have happened in their past and it keeps them from the things that God wants to give them. How much do you need to see in order to choose trusting the hand of God over the hand of man? Proverbs 16 says, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. I, I've come here with just a simple thought and I'm finished if you want to stand all that I know is that the blessing and the promise of this book, it doesn't only apply to some super elite person. It doesn't only apply to some perfect person that's got it all together and they don't anyway. But what it belongs to is it belongs to the people of the name. It belongs to people that are living in a covenant relationship with God. And so the question that I have for you is why not? Why not you? Why not your family? Why can't God make a difference in your home that only God can do? There's blessing, my goodness, there is blessing upon every person in this room today. If you'll obey the voice of God, if you'll listen to the word of God, if you'll subject yourself to his will and not mine, God is ready and he is able to meet you in everything that you have done. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. It's for you. That's all I've got. It's for you. The blessings and the promise of God are for you. Would you lift up your hands? Would you call up on his name today? As Pastor Cody prepares to come, would you just claim every promise, every word? It's not for somebody else. It's for me. It's for my family. It's for my future. God's going to do a work that only he can do. If you believe it, would you shout out amen? amen. Would you lift up your voice with a shout of triumph and believe that it's for me? Come on, let's lift our hands and respond to the word this morning. I want everything that you have for my family. Come on all over this room. There's a call of God in this room this morning. I want everything that you have for my family. There is a very, there is a very real call of God. Brother Eric had no, has no idea what I'm preaching at the 11 o'clock. But God wants to do something very specific today in this, in this room. Before you leave this place, God's calling some people out of where you are. God's call, we didn't come here just to fulfill a religious duty, a routine. I realize it's summer. I realize pastor is not here, but there's a call of the Lord in this house. And here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to take off your expectations of what today looks like. And I'm asking you to be available to what God would say to you today. He's speaking clearly. He's speaking very clearly. They're going to turn on prayer music, but would you lift your hands toward heaven? Come on, somebody in this room. Somebody in this room. Come on, be here today. Come on, be available to God's voice today. Be available to God's spirit today. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. God, I want the promises of Deuteronomy 28 to be on me and my family. God, I want the promises of your word. I don't want you just to see evidence in others. God, I want to experience it for myself. 
I want to experience everything that you have for me. In the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. They're going to turn on prayer music. You're welcome to fellowship out in the foyer. We're so glad that all of you are here today.